What's up, college baseball fans? Welcome to another episode of the 11.7 Podcast. Joined with me here today, the one and only Dimitri Rizgod. Jack DeLongshaw, sipping out of his Pencil Talk mug. And shout out to Pencil Talk. He just released a uh, one-on-one interview with Troy Trojan's head coach, Skylar Mead. I watched it. My mom watched it. She gave good feedback, too. She was a big fan. Let's so, go. Yeah, she's jumping on the Troy Troy Trojan's bandwagon now. Um, she loved the interview. But, yeah, y'all go, y'all go talk uh, – not talk. Y'all go check out know. Pencil Talk, uh, the pod with Jack. A lot of content coming out. Uh, also saw your interview with um, – AMAC 99 from NC State. I was standing right behind you when you were doing that too. But awesome guy, uh, awesome guy. It's a uh, it's an early morning here episode Thursday, April 25th, and uh, we're here to preview the weekend, recap the midweek, and um, as always, we're going to start the show with a little home field apparel. Our partners over there, uh, team of the week. Now we've done a lot of teams, so instead of team of the week, we're going to have mascots of the week. And they have a mascot collection here. So you just go to collections, boom. I'm sharing my screen here on the YouTube, if I can get there. And, uh, man, hold on. Here we go. Go to mascots, boom. And they got a bunch of mascot shirts. A lot of different schools. Over 100 of these bad boys. My favorite one, the vintage Colorado School of Mines blaster tee with the, uh, I think that might be a mule or a donkey. The donkey. The donkey's elite. Uh, I always love this throwback UConn sad Husky shirt. It just cracks me up every time. Um, but you guys go to homefieldapparel.com. Big partners of ours. Um, they're about to drop a lot of new stuff here within the next few weeks. Um, but use our promo code CWS24. It's like College World Series 24. And uh, you get 15% off your first purchase. And uh, this Alabama Crimson Tide one is awesome too. Yeah, some really cool stuff. If Wisconsin, no baseball team, but I guess they have a pretty good hockey team. They have some cool mascots, 11 pages worth. So y'all go check them out there. Uh, just homefieldapparel.com, promo code CWS. Boys, how are we feeling? I'm going to open up the floor. Not a ton to talk about, but, um, you know, I think there's enough, enough to make a podcast episode out of. Uh, how are we feeling? Shout out Skyler Mead, dropping a follow on Twitter. I'm not a big Twitter guy, like, for my personal account. So, hey, shout out to him. I'll keep up with what the Troy Trojans are doing now. And then uh, also, Jack, that inner thigh was looking sexy. I know you put it away, but it, it was up there. I, it was making an appearance. <laughs> I got uh, I got chicken legs, so I appreciate the kind words. Dude, you guys both are just compliments of the century to start this thing off. First and foremost, Mom Upton bringing a tear to my eye this morning. Let's go. A fan of the pencil. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I got to get in the weight room, Dimitri. These chicken legs are far malnourished. Uh, and and thirdly, I think that after we talked to all the trash in the world about how this midweek was going to suck, it was pretty on brand that we got some pretty awesome matchups, specifically on Tuesday. Um, I, I feel like it was – I don't know if it was because I didn't have a game this week, but I feel like it was the most locked in to midweek baseball I've been from like a 5, a, like 5 p.m to 3 a.m. slate this year. Yeah, I always judge the uh, midweek slate based off of uh, investment lines, uh, you know, checking out the DraftKings, whatever, or whatever sports book you use. And I'm like, I was scrolling through and I was like, man, a lot of these games like don't like pop. Like they're not like super underdogs that I think are going to win, blah, 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 blah. Um, but you're right. Like as far as like pure locked in entertainment, uh, the, the games turn out to be really good. And we're going to start right here with that Clemson-Georgia game. Ended up going extra innings. Nobody could score. And I know Jack's going to go on a rant here in just a second about uh, first and second, nobody out, extra innings, nobody scored in seven innings. Let's just bunt the baseball and see what happens. Uh, We got to see intentional walks with runners on base, putting the winning run on base. Um, Shout out to Clemson. First team to finally do it to Charlie Condon. And I, I can back that idea. Like, don't let your best guy, like their best guy beat us. I mean, he could beat you with one swing of the bat. So we'll, we'll dive into that as well. But there was just a lot of lessons and like a lot of good baseball chess moves um, in Athens on Tuesday night. And we were close, close to seeing the 20 inning marathon that we saw in 2019 there. And I still remember the podcast we did. We waited until the very end of the night to record 
me and my buddy James, uh, who used to do the podcast with me. And I think we ended up recording at like 2.30 a.m. It was, uh, but it was a fun episode. And I'm sure you guys can find it if you want to listen to it. You can probably just search like UGA Clemson 20 any game 11.7. The pod will pop up. But yeah, I, I thought that was a very super regional atmosphere. It was a, um, some people want to say like College World Series atmosphere. Like, no, like that type of game doesn't happen in Omaha. It, it would happen like a regional or super regional. It, it felt like a, a regional final or a elimination game or a Saturday night 1 0 game in a regional. Yeah, no, you're right. Like an elimination game in a regional or game three of a super where you're just out of pitching. Obviously, like both teams started using starters, like all weekend starter, Saturday guys, um, some guys that pitch on Sundays because they had to. But uh, yeah, I mean, like pitching was low. But the guys that came in, like one of your George Mason guys comes in and, and slams the door, Jack. And uh, wait, no? Yeah, no, he did. He looked good. Okay. I, 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 for hypothetical investors, I was like, oh, here comes a Mason guy to ruin Georgia better days. Like, <laughs> yeah. But Christian Maragna, who's thrown on Sundays for him all year, has been spectacular. I, I, well, I My biggest takeaway from both of these teams was I, I felt like they were guys, like especially with Clemson who can bang around the baseball, like, it did feel like one of those elimination games where like at the end of it, you go, if you don't win this game, you're done. So because you've got nothing left in the tank, right? Yep. Every guy that George and Clemson brought out of the pen was better than the next. Like it felt like Clemson brought three or four, 94, 95 dudes right after one, after another. And I was like, yo, these two teams, like I hand up, like maybe I'm not that I've been sleeping, but like they have the ability to go win it in Omaha just off of like a 15 inning game because of, how deep they were and how they were able to silence these like really potent offense for five and a half hours plus. Yeah. Um, it's crazy to think about. I, I never, you, like when you think Georgia and Clemson, you don't think, holy shit, they're like two, an hour and a half apart, two hours apart. Like, I know. That should be a bigger rivalry than it is, but I always forget that they're so close. Yeah. It's, it's like an hour, hour and a half at the most back roads of Georgia to South Carolina. It, they're really close. I know their fans hate each other, but that's more of a football thing. And, uh, but anyways, yeah, I think there was a lot of lessons we could learn from that game. One of them is, and look, I'm not against it, but you can just tell after the 11th inning of almost any college baseball game, probably MLB too, guys are just swinging for the fences. Like there were so many just high fly balls to the warning track or to, uh, I mean, like guys were just trying to tee off and end the game with one swing. And it happens, I, I've probably talked about it a bunch on this show. So like longtime listeners, they, they've probably heard me say this quite a bit, but it's every time 12th inning on in college baseball, you see the biggest, like loopiest swings of all time. And it, I was just keeping up with it as the game went on. I'm like, yeah, no one's going to score with a base hit. Like, it's going to have to take a wild pitch or a, you know, four walks in a, in a row, something like that. Cause everybody was just trying to end the game with one swing. I don't blame him. I would have done the same thing. I, I would have do the done thing. the same thing. I've do done the same thing. thing. I well, I wouldn't have. And can we dive into that a little bit? I, I yeah, here we go. Why. I was leading it up for you and your bunting situation. I was going to say, I, I and I don't know if it's something about the pencil that still loves a little small ball in their life. And I say it in major league baseball games too, where analytics have taken over everything. But I tweeted it out like I think it was ending the twelve where it happened to get happened in the tenth, happened in the twelfth where Georgia gets runners on first and second, nobody out to start the inning and go, okay, here they go. They're going to win the game now, right? The first time it happens, it's the leadoff hitter for Georgia who's hitting 310 with 10 homers on the year. So I understand that he's got the ability to leave the yard and win the game or a, a ball that gets to the infield and you win it. He punches out a fly ball to center field, which would have been a sack fly, and then a ground out to end the inning, and you're like, oh, wait. And the 12th, same thing happens, except it's the eight hole up. Ground ball, double play, next guy strikes out, inning over. What happened to the sacrifice bunt? Like, it, are we too cool for school? Do we just think the analytics were, hey, we? I think that our ball club is more likely to see three singles through the infield to score a run. Like, do they not understand the implications of, like, pitching with runners in scoring position? And, Dimitri, you can attest to this far more than I can. But as a catcher, I knew that there was far more added pressure when I could – feel a guy 90 feet away, right? These aren't professional players. I, it is a different mentality with runners on second and third than maybe first and second with one out or two. Like, it feels different. So why, for the love of God, can we not put a bunt down? 
which, by the way, doesn't assure that a college player isn't going to pick it up and throw it in Narnia, right? Yep. So, PFP is so. hard. It's not that easy. You put a perfect butt down and make a guy make a play, which, by the way, the added pressure of picking it up and going, oh, if I don't throw this directly to my guy, we lose. I don't understand it. And people on Twitter blew me up about, like, well, who was it in the box? Is he a good punter? I don't give a damn. If you play Division One college baseball, you should learn how to bunt. It is inevitable that you should be able to bunt. And I got people tell me, well, this guy hasn't bunted since he was 12, 13 years old. Well, then change it. Be different. Fucking bunt. It makes no sense to me. And I'm going to freak out about the Houston Astros have lost four or five games because they refuse to bunt too. That's a whole different other story. But I, I, it happened twice in extra innings where I'm like, this isn't like we're playing the long game and trying to score a bunch of runs. This is I want to win a game right now, and I don't get it, guys. Someone educate me. What do you got? So, as of three, four years ago, analytics came in and said bunting is a bad idea. Bunting gives away a free out. You have three chances to hit a single to the outfield, score the run. So what's the point of giving up an out when you can just hit a base hit? That's the and that's the reasoning logic behind it. I think it's fucking stupid as well. Oh, I think man. I think, dude, put the bun down, guys on third base, one slider in the dirt, he scored. This is this isn't big league ball where catchers are blocking ninety nine percent of pitches. We see I see wild pitches literally almost every inning, at least one in inning. Pitchers are not. Skilled enough yet to throw 0-2 breaking ball just an inch off the dirt, give their catcher a chance. It's put it in the dirt. That's the mindset of a college pitcher. Put it in the dirt. 0-2, do not give them anything to hit kind of thing. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's so annoying that the analytics and the, oh, it, it became like a fad almost where it's like, okay, oh, now, nah, man, we're too cool to bunt over here. We're too cool to bunt. Like, no, dude, put the damn bunt down. Run down the first base, hard 90. Go have have your teammates hand. You got the job done. Let the next guy do it. Hand it off to the next guy. Put him in a better spot to do it. It's not that hard. It's really not that hard. Yeah, the uh, so as like kind of an analytics guy, or at least trying to become one, um, I look, maybe not try to become one, but I try to look at both sides of the coin. The, The reason behind like not bunting first and second, nobody out, in extra innings is because when you bunt them over, they're just going to walk the next guy, set up a double play, right? Like that's the major league baseball yep. um, analytics behind it. And there's a ton of stats and like a ton of, I mean, stats going back hundreds of years, about hundred years saying that like, you're more likely to turn a double play than like whatever. But those are major league baseball stats. Like how often do we see a routine ground ball to shortstop, like not turn into a double play? Like they just don't turn it as fast. Runners are a little bit faster out of the box or whatever uh, in college ball. And like, so like my point is, even if they, you bunt them over, they intentionally walk the next guy. Your chances of hitting into a double play are like fairly slim. Like you want it to be where you can hit a fly ball to the outfield and make a college arm throw you out at home plate. Like the sack fly is what you got to be playing for or the wild pitch or just four straight balls. Um, I mean, it's not guaranteed strikes in this league. So Man, I would have loved to see Georgia play it different because I guarantee you this. And, and Clemson had opportunities too to bunt, and they just didn't. Um, it's going to come to like a regional or a super regional, maybe Omaha, where they're like in the same exact situation, and they're going to freak out and try to bunt. And their guys have not bunted during the season, and they're going to mess it up. Like they're going to pop up the bunt, bunt through three pitches, can bunt you, it foul, whatever. Like the, a midweek is like perfect. A midweek in the thirteenth inning is the perfect opportunity to work on like your bunting game for the future, like to try to win a national championship. So I, I see both sides of it. Um, I'm sure the Georgia guys like have not practiced bunting and I'm sure no the doubt. coach, coach, jo- coach Johnson was like, Hey, we'll take our chances with a ball in the gap or a base hit uh, to win the game. So let's get Bennett on the phone. His son is swinging. You know, his son take daddy hacks every day in his little yeah. videos. Yeah, I'm does. sure. I am sure that word "bunt" is not even used that used in that household. Um, no, Brock Bennett not, ain't bunting. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> uh, one more thing I want to talk about in this game, bro. Why do we have replay if they're just gonna mess it up? Like I, I saw. <laughs> look, I was having some fun on Twitter with the, with the Clemson fans just because I think it's fun to like mess with some fan bases every once in a while, but. I mean, there was a clear home run that crossed behind the foul pole, and the call got overturned. It was called fair, and then they reversed it to foul. Um, 
what's the point of having replay if we're going to mess it up that bad? Like, that was a brutal call. It cost Clemson a win. And, uh, like, sure, there's other things in the game that you can point at that possibly led to – like, they had other opportunities to win the game. But, man, like, taking a home run away from a kid because you look at a video and, like, there's – the evidence is clear. Like, that was a home run. Yeah. I think Clemson fans and, like, Clemson's team has, like, a real argument. Like, we should have won that game. Dude. I watched the replay, I want to say 15, 20 times. You know how like sometimes you can just see the color blur, like on the foul pole? Like you can just kind of see like a streak of whatever color, like white, obviously for a baseball. That ball went behind it. Yeah. 100%. It was like obvious that ball went behind it. But they're so I scared to overturn what they called on the field. So like basically the way replay works is if they're indisputable evidence. That's the only way they overturn him. Like, dude, you're trusting your, you're going with the call that your eyes made, but what you see on video at whatever speed you want, they can't overturn it because it's not indisputable. I'm like, dude, I might have it wrong, but I mean, I was watching the game. I'm pretty sure they called it a home run on the field and they overturned it to foul. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right. Which is way worse to your point because usually it's going to be indisputable. It, you know, it was bad because for the, one of the rare times in our in our social media history, everyone was like, "Yo, they messed this up." Like there was no <laughs> there was no countering argument. Like even Clemson or even Georgia fans were like, "Yeah, that was pretty fucking bad." Like I, there was it was inconclusive. Where all of Twitter Nation was like, "Yeah, that was a big miss up on the boys." Like, yeah, I, I don't I don't get it. I, I think like I'm curious like what what they look at like when they go back and look at like they had the same view we did. So what is it that they saw that we didn't? which is always kind of my big point. Like, what am I missing here? It's funny. The the replay booths are really funny in college baseball because, like, every stadium has it different. Like, I know when I did the uh, Charleston Southern game, they had replay, and they would go to, like, a little, like, back room or whatever. There's a, there's a field. I forget who it is. Maybe, like, Virginia Tech where they – I don't know. There's, like, a Power 5 school that has it, like, literally in, like, a shed that you would buy at Home Depot, and they have, like, TV set up. So – Sometimes the umpires are set up with, uh, I don't know, bad looks or bad angles or whatever. I don't know. But I, I just want to know what they saw in that replay to overturn that call. Because from the angles we saw, there was nothing. Like, absolutely nothing to overturn it. That brings up another point, too. When we get to, like, postseason time and regionals and stuff and these mid-major schools want to host, it ain't just about how many fans can you put in. Because the old rumor has always been 3,000 minimum to host a regional of bleacher seats, whatever. Shit, you better have five camera angles that can catch every part of the field now because you're yeah. gonna lose, you're gonna have people losing their mind if you go to for some small school that's just hosting a regional and they have one, two, maybe three cameras. No, you need all five, they covered that whole field. Yeah, uh, and I think they do during during regionals. I think ESPN yeah, brings some, in some other field, cameras. Some fields are built weird where like you like you have to like you just have to do a lot of things to make sure you cover every square inch of that field because yeah. Replay, replays are everything now. And with the college baseball getting bigger, social media wise on the internet presence, you're going to get backlash. You're going to get a lot of blowback when you blow back, like make these kind of horrific calls. In my opinion. Yeah. This was the first bad replay overturn that I've seen since I think it was a 2022 regional at Louisville when Michigan got thrown out at second base. He was like clearly safe and they oh, he called was. him and safe on the field. Out. <laughs> no, I just remember them messing up that call. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Oh, okay, I was going to say, no, I, they called him so safe good. on the field, and, and it was like the, the go-ahead run on second base. It was late in the game. They called him safe on the field. They overturned it to out, and people were like, what? Like, how did you see something that made him – whatever. Do you, um, remember, do you remember that home run Southern Miss hit? It was against LSU, right? I don't which I don't remember which one you're talking in, about. In the regional or super regional Southern Miss um, – Hit that grand slam down right field line. It was like you don't know. Remember what I'm talking about, dude? It was like it was literally the swing that could have changed. They wouldn't went to Omaha. They literally would have went to Omaha. How long ago? Two years ago. No, last year. It was last it was like year. Tennessee in the Super. Two, last two year. years ago. Two years ago, I think. Dude, you don't remember this? Hell, Southern sure. Miss was literally going to Omaha if this ball would have been fair. And they replayed it for like 10 minutes. What? You don't remember this? 
don't remember this either. It's I'm not ringing a bell. No. Keep keep discussing. I'm pulling it up right now. It was it was at LSU. No, at the P. Southern Miss was hosting LSU in our oh, super shoot. regional. I feel like LSU didn't go. To LSU. Do you not remember that regional? Kennesaw State, LSU. Um, oh, Army. Army. Yeah, Army, yeah, I remember LSU, that. LSU, Southern Miss. I remember that regional now. Yep. I let, me try to find, let me try to find that home run. And it went, it was a foul ball? Like a foul, foul, foul ball. ball. It, was, it would have been a grand slam. Man, it's not ringing a bell. Anyways, while you're pulling it up, um, yep, okay, yep. Georgia's got, I mean, Georgia's got a really good chance to become a host, boys. Like with that win against Clemson midweek, like, midweeks matter. They jumped up in the RPI, they jumped up in ELO, they jumped up in everything. Plus, now they no. get to go play a road game against uh, a road series against number one Texas A&M. So even if they went one and two this weekend, they're going to jump up in the RPI again. Yeah. Um, they might even jump up even if they go zero and three. Sorry, it's guys. that type of uh, that type of series for Georgia. So everything's out in front of the Bulldogs. Sorry, you guys. Up? Ole Miss. It was it was that super regional against Ole Miss. Okay, oh. I remember yes. the super uh, regional Ole Miss two years ago. I still I don't remember the home run. I'm I'm gonna pull up the video. I'm working on it right now. Okay, um, Jack, you got any thoughts about the uh, the uh, the Georgia Bulldogs? Like, are you are you a believer in their team or? Yeah, what do you think? I, feel like, I feel like I've paid more attention to them like since like Charlie Common's become like you know a potential triple crown guy. I uh, I think that there's this really unique possibility that they even jump into becoming a national host. Like, I, I know that they're 20 right now, but I think that they could be a top eight team by the all said and done. I was talking to a buddy of mine, Chase Martos, who's a huge Georgia fan. And, like, we just kind of sat down and looked at the remaining schedule. Um, but with some, like, studs that, like, can pitch in a lot of versatile roles in that back end, like Daniel Patisak, who throws for the University of Georgia. Like, he was a Charleston Southern guy that has started games. He's closed. He's thrown He's also – Average. He also pitched in the World Baseball Classic last year. And he's the only Division One player that threw in the WBC. So, like, he loves yeah. throwing in the big moments. Like, they've got a lot of really fun pieces that I think have, are ready for that moment. Like, maybe they're a team that, like, is ready to take the next step while they're more so the hunter than the hunted. Yeah. The, the only thing – so, they're number nine right now in the RPI, which, like, you look at it and you're thinking – like, oh, yeah, of course they'll be a national seed or they have a chance to. But the only thing is they have A&M on the road, then Vanderbilt on the road at South Carolina, and South Carolina plays really well at home. And then they're going to play against Florida that last weekend series, and that's going to be, in my opinion, like Florida's going to have to win that weekend to, uh, you know, have a chance at the at the postseason. So, all right, here's the home. That ball smoked deep to right. Oh, I do remember Foul this. Ball. Wow. <laughs> you, you remember this now? You I, dude, I remember it. this now. Yep. That ball smoked deep yep. to right. <laughs> Foul ball. And they Bro, couldn't the get a good angle. Of every Southern Myth fan was like, no shit. <laughs> you ain't can't believe it. Right. And uh, we'll be... this was the year that Ole Miss won the national championship, too. See? All right. Yep. Get a closer look. Volusia, that would... See, to me, that... Oh, that went like behind that the foul play ball. when yeah. we do that. If it disappears, obviously... From... But see, it oh, looks like it stays... Oh, oh. See? Southern Miss would have went to Omaha. Probably would have won the national championship. I mean, see, I mean, to me, we can't say 100% like it would have been four three in the fifth inning, but you know that momentum would have been... But see, it looks like it stays... The other way. But wow. Yeah. Replay, man. We get better cameras. Like we should be able to see that. We should be able to see the difference. I think we could. I think that was clearly a home run. <laughs> so that did. was 2022 Super Regional. And I think my brother might have been at that game. If I, if I remember correctly. Wow. And when you look back on it, Ole Miss goes on a run, wins the College World Series, could have been Southern Miss. A Lucia went on a historical legendary run. Yeah. That postseason. And I mean, think about it. Oh my God, dude. It was just the script was already written. I uh, they get their natty, Ole Miss gets their natty, LSU get their natty, and then they all don't do shit for the next twelve months. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have something for you guys. I, I it was the only thing that I wrote down. I, uh, then I saw that your your Bet Rivers deal that you guys tweeted out from the main account about yep. 
odds I'm making just the College World Series. And, and seeing some of those lines of of, of mid-major teams getting there, like plus 600, 700, I'm like, that just feels like still not enough to me. Like there's so many things, as we just saw, that have to go your way in those moments for you just to even have an opportunity to get to Omaha be one of the final eights. I know that we're kind of at past that halfway point, but gun to your head, you got to take one team, ride or die. And since we know that a mid-major's winning it since it's one of eight years, who is that team for you today that you feel best about? I, I know Coastal just scuffled against a really good Creighton team. And I know Southern Miss, like I, I, there are a lot of teams that you can make a stake. And I'm curious where y'all's head is at today. If you had to take a mid-major, who you riding with? Just to get I think there's one clear front runner and it's, it's East Carolina. Like you look at the build of their roster and I mean, you got two, like between you Savage and Root, one, two punch. Plus you get the double last name closer. I, I never remember his name. I, I probably can't even pronounce it, but the best pitcher in the nation, like best closer in the nation. Uh, I mean, that's the formula for mid-major get to Omaha. And plus you have the storyline of uh, a team that's never made it, but they've been really close. This feels like the year that East Carolina not only makes it to Omaha, but could win the whole thing. And like they have a very salty. Wyatt like, Longsford Shankman. Yeah, yeah Longsford Shankman, uh, an elite closer. And he's an, he's a guy that they can rely multiple innings on, like you want especially to in the postseason. You want, you want me to share his number for the people listeners? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I know he's got like a one ERA. 45 innings pit, 35 hit, 16 walks, 77 Ks, and a 1.0 ERA and a 1.13 whip. So nice basically team. 20 appearances, 45 innings. So he's going about two innings in appearance. Um, he's only got five saves, five saves, which is interesting, but – He's there. He's there. Come in seventh, eighth inning. Shut this shit down. Yep. So yeah, that, I mean, I think there's a clear answer. If you're looking at a non-power five team to make it to Omaha, I mean, East Carolina right now, and like the way that their lineups built, they have no easy outs. They they keep getting big wins. They have a series win over North Carolina. So, like, as long as they don't get matched up with a, I feel like East Carolina always gets matched up in a super regional with a team that's just red hot. Really? Uh, a team that's just not losing. And it happens with like Vanderbilt. It happens with Texas. Like they just get put in these regionals with, or super regionals with teams that like they're just not losing. So um, yeah, East Carolina say, to me, I think is the clear answer. I was going to say, I can't answer that question because East Carolina, Dallas Baptist, Coastal, Southern Miss, all these teams equally, equally can make it to Omaha. Is whichever gets the, the best draw. That's what it comes down to. I mean, yep. it, it just comes down to who gets the best draw. Coastal Carolina, they made it and they won it all only because of that crazy rain delay. It's just, it's just that's how hard it is to make Omaha. It's just like, like I can't pick because I could sit here and say if Indiana State would have the least likely chance to make it of Coastal, you know, Southern Miss, least talented, whatever. But if they get paired up with, I don't know. SEMA as a four seed wins their Kentucky regional or whatever. Indiana State wins their regional. They're two wins away from Omaha because they got they get lucky. They're matching up with SEMA. Yeah. Kind of thing. Like it's just it's just a draw thing. I I, I think you're spot on. I, I wanted to bring it up in hopes of one of y'all referring to ECU because I feel like we got ripped a little bit on Twitter because we showed uh, Alec Makarevich a ton of love this week. And and, and I don't care. I, I understand that ECU fans it, and it feels probably like a, a big league fan. Or you you're, you feel wronged by a guy leaving free agency, but man, we were so stoked for that story because yes, he is a fan of the brand, um, but more so like his story is awesome. Like he gets the opportunity to face his former teammates, his former ball club, and and despite the fallout of him leaving ECU, like to get to go hit a home run in a place that is like booing the hell out of him is stuff that dreams are made of. Like it really, it was like a super awesome moment. Um, ECU ends up winning the game. EC fans probably think we hate them because we're all over the AMAC 99 trade. But them getting Starling back in that lineup and hitting and just casually hitting for the cycle in a game that they beat a top tier NC State team. I was like, oh man, like, is this it? Like, do they have the magic and like a little bit of that chip on the shoulder FU energy to like go get it done this year? And they do it in the jungle. Um, Can I? Yeah, go ahead. What you got? What do you think? I wanted to ask something about the AMAC thing. 
I promise you, this is for East Carolina fans. I promise you, two, three years down the road from now, when East NC State and East Carolina are playing in a football game on a in a fall Saturday afternoon, he will be yeah. decked out in purple and gold. He's an East Carolina guy. Same thing with Paul Skeen. If Air Force and LSU are playing, he's going to be an Air Force guy. Like that's yeah. where the part is. They made a business decision at the end of their college career, whether it's to get drafted, whether it's a playing time or it's a coach they wanted to work with, whatever the case may be. They made a business decision, but their heart is where they went to school for those four, three, four hey, years. All of his boys are still there. That was beautifully said. Like he is a dude that like he just did it to when he talked to Ben and I, he was like, from a hitting philosophy, I wanted to like challenge myself. Right. Like this was no slight on East Carolina. Right. Like East Carolina beats NC State every year. They they swept them this year in the midweeks. Like this wasn't about like, oh, I think NC State's a better baseball team than East Carolina or vice versa. Like he just wanted to challenge himself in the ACC week in and week out. He wanted to like challenge himself from like drawing free night. He's like, Bingo. Hey, strictly a baseball philosophy move. Like there was no bad blood. I saw it as a Paul Skeen's move too. And then getting to talk to him, it kind of confirms it. Um, Again, if you're an ECU fan, like, yeah, sure, but, but like, you're right. He's Hurston like Waldrop is a Southern Miss guy. Like, I agree. Like, these guys, Hurston Waldrop is sitting in his living room on a Saturday night playing video games. I guarantee he's got a Southern Miss shirt on or Southern Miss sweatpants on. I'm sure, oh, yeah, sure, he'll go out in public and wear his Florida Gators, you know, Nike warm up shirt in his minor league locker room or whatever, because Florida Gators, like, whatever. But that guy is a Southern Miss guy at heart. Most of these guys that transfer after their two, three years, where they ever you went as a freshman and you did well and you stay for your sophomore year, that's your home school. That's your school usually. Unless, you know, like Paul Skeens went to win a national championship, big fan base, LSU. It's easy to fall into the, I'm an LSU guy now. But right. his heart, his heart is Air Force. Yeah. I mean, both of you guys are dead on. Um I, I, yeah. I will say, like, there's probably some guys yeah. that leave on bad terms that oh, are no yeah. longer. Yeah, I mean, the end of the Skyhawk for life. Skyhawk for life. I only played one season there, but Sky listen, Hawk. but if Mercer's playing UT Martin in football, I'm, I'm decked out in Mercer gear. <laughs> that's, the, that's the difference. Can we talk about Mercer real quick? I They the they Bears. destroyed Georgia Southern yesterday. for the, uh, That might have been their first win over Georgia Southern in history. Uh, at least since I was playing, uh, but they did get destroyed the day before. So I was half right. I was like, Mercer never beats Georgia Southern. And I was uh, half wrong. Someone the someone did. I think the SOCON will produce a strong postseason team. Whoever comes out of that SOCON tournament at floor field will produce a strong tournament team. Now, they are they going to go? Are they going to go to the regional final? Maybe not, but they're going to cause trouble and they're going to make a one seed or a two seed use some pitching that they didn't want to use. Um, that's that's pretty much all you can ask for is be competitive from these four scenes. Make it make it make it interesting. I think the folks on Stanford, I mean shit, Stanford, Wofford, obviously are your two top dogs right now, but East Carolina, UNC, Greensboro, Mercer will challenge a one seed, whoever comes out of that SOCON tournament. No doubt about it. I would say this, whatever whatever SOCON team ends up a four seed in a regional, that one seed better not use – they better not use their Saturday guy. Like, they better throw a Friday guy. I don't think they will. I'm just telling you it would be a mistake. You would – I would be – I would bet – I if I were the one seed and I was facing Wofford or Sanford, I would throw my Friday guy. Against those two ball clubs, I would have to throw my Friday guy because yeah. their offenses aren't that deadly. 100%. Um, all right, boys, you want to do the uh, weekend series pick them? I know Dimitri's got to leave here in about 20 minutes. So, uh, fun, fun weekend series pick them slate. We, ha we have the always famous Army Navy, um, with the special graphic Dimitri makes every single time the American flag in the background. We also have here, let me share my screen. I should probably do that. Boom, boom. That way the people can see. Yeah, look, Army Navy. United States flag behind it. Always cool. Uh, Moorhead State at SEMO. This is business. Podcast decisions. Team Moorhead. I should have worn my Moorhead gear. Versus Southeastern Missouri. Oregon at Oregon State. Florida State at Duke. Southern Miss at Louisiana Lafayette. And um, Kentucky at South Carolina. Let's look at, take a look at the leaderboard. Cola B-Ball. First place. 44-18 and 18 this year. That is nuts. Q Millie, 43 and 19. That's still really good. Smiles, 117, 43 and 19. 
So shout out to everybody on the top 10 leaderboard. Even like 10th place is 40 and 22, which is nuts. So anyways, we're going to start here at the top. Navy and Army. Navy is... 24 and 17 on the year, 14 and 8 over uh, in the uh, Patriot League. Army 23 and 17, 12 and 6 in the Patriot League. Hey Ben, take your window and don't make it full screen. It'll it'll zoom in on the picks better. Take my window. There you go. Mm, freaky. Is that no, better? No, scroll oh. down. Scroll down. Well, you don't have to make it that small, but I like it. I'm learning how to do this. But bang, out a boy. Is that better? A little, little bit more for the YouTube. A little bit more. I'm learning computer stuff right now, making my screen bigger. Making my way down. To there it. we go. Round That's of good. applause. For All the right, let's go. I figured it out. Thanks, Dimitri. Computer yeah. wizard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Yo, wizard. All right, hey. anyways. Navy at Army. I know where Dimitri's going to go already, but I do I do want to make a case here for Navy winning this series. Look, I know Army runs the Patriot Big League. Big brain. And, what? I said big brain. Big brain. Yeah, I mean, we. I think ever since we've done the show, Army's won the Patriot League. And uh, so we're used to having Army get that automatic bid. And, um, I mean, they just they're just better. But I do have a case. I do have a case for the Navy midshipmen, okay? They have not only won some pretty big series for, like, their standards. Like, they, they've won a series against Elon, which everybody knows, like, shout out Elon. They beat uh, Wake Forest in the midweek at Elon, which is a, uh, a solid weekend series win. Um, they've also split with Army already this year. Um, they played them in a midweek. Or actually, it was a doubleheader Sunday, it looks like. That's weird. Um, but they beat them five to two, lost eight to one, and that was at home. So look, I'm going to go with Army, but I think if you look at at Navy's weekend series, like they win pretty much every weekend series. So maybe they were built more for a uh, a weekend series rather than a uh, midweek against Army. But it's at Army, so I'm going to make the easy decision here. I'm taking Army. The pen comes off the head. I know Jack stuck his little stupid uh, Dixon Ticonderoga pencil under his beanie very discreetly to to try to one up me. Pretty, pretty, pretty cringe, if you ask me. <laughs> Army, it is. All right, I want I want to go be different. I want to be different in this America series. But you got to go. Army is the blue blood of the Patriot League. They don't lose this series. They don't lose this league. And until they do, I'm not picking against them. Give me Army at home. The Black Knight. How can how can I sit here and go miss Shipman? You just can't do it. They haven't, they haven't. I will say though, I'm really happy that they're having a successful year. This is the first time I've looked at Navy and been like, wow, they actually have a chance in this series. They look good. They winning ball game. Ben, I don't think we've ever thought twice about this series in the last five years. Nope. So, you haven't had to. Give me Army. Jack's going to take Navy, I hope, but give me Army. All right, so here, here's the deal. Early on in my pick em career with you guys on board, I think I was just maybe trying to be a people pleaser and be like, yeah, I'm going to play into it, and I'm not going to go clean sweep. But I'm not going to pander on this pick. I'm taking Army, and let me tell you why. Let's go ahead and first off congratulate Navy. Uh, the boy, Zach Biggers, who's a former Patriot League stud, stud second base, he's going to be pissed at my pick. But I'm taking West Point. They turned to six double plays the other night. Six. Their middle infield, they turned to six double plays in one game. You want to talk about defending the position well. Their middle infield is nasty. They got this kid, Derek Berg, who plays second base for him. He's at the top of the lineup. Stud middle infielder. Army's going to defend well. They're going to continue to play well. They're going to win the series. They're going to win the Patriot League. Uh, my Bucknell pick's not looking so hot. Give me Army, and let's formally congratulate Navy on their series win. I just noticed something. Why? I, I'm kind of annoyed now. Kentucky and Florida State should be have their ranking next to them. Maybe it's just – I don't know what's going on there, but Kentucky is ranked for the YouTube viewer, and Florida State is ranked as well. So yeah. I just wanted to point that out there. All right, moving on to the OVC. 
Big matchup for the pod. Moorhead State at SEMO. If this is the first time you're listening to the pod or maybe don't know the story, Moorhead State sent uh, Coach Coach Ward over at Moorhead State, sent Jack and myself an awesome gift, uh, let's see, gift bag, I guess you could call it, gift box, full of Moorhead State gear. And uh, it's because we picked them to win the OVC. Dimitri's been a SEMO guy through and through for six years now. Always picked SEMO to win the OVC. He says it's their league, whatever. And uh, they're matching up. So we've had this one circled on the calendar for a while. Look, I, I know it's at SEMO. And I know that like I've been spoiled by Coach Ward over at Moorhead State. But like I think Moorhead State's the better team. And I really do. Like They're led. They have three guys that have OPSs over 1,100, which is nuts. Two of those guys, uh, Riley Priest, I believe his name is, and Colton Becker, are like 30 extra base hits, 20 stolen base guys already. Like power, speed, they got it all. And then they got my boy Roman, uh, I believe it's Kuntz, Kuntz. K-U-N-T-Z. Kuntz. I believe it's Kuntz. Uh, Roman it. Kuntz, he, uh, he's like fifth in the nation in home runs with 20. Yep. So those three guys are going to lead Moorhead State to the victory, a series victory at SEMO and, uh, and put themselves in position to possibly win the OVC. Easy. Are you done with your spiel? Yep. Jack, go ahead and give your spiel, too. Go ahead. Just get it all out there. You want me to do it, too? Just go ahead and give it all out there. Got to be Roman Coons. Got to be. There's no other way to say it, or else we'd be giggling. Roman Coons, top five in the country in homers. How about third with 60 RBIs? Not only do they have the best player in the conference, they have a top five player in the country right now. Riz, God, your boys are in trouble this weekend. In trouble this weekend. Maybe a name to giggle about. Nothing to giggle about his game. Give me more head. Grab your brooms. It's a mess. Time out. Did you just say grab the broom? Sweep city, Riz God. Guarantee Sweep. that shit. Guarantee that shit then. Stand on it. You can't guarantee uh, a sweep on the road. That's not. See, you guys are all bark, no bite around here. All bark, I'm guaranteed, no bite. but I'm not guaranteed a sweep. Number one, from a content standpoint, yes, Moorhead State did not send me anything. From a real life factual <laughs> standpoint, Ben just decided to keep the gear from me, and so we could have two of these, so we didn't have to wash it because he wears that damn thing every day. He could alternate every day, save some money on water and laundry bill, whatever it is. So that's where my hoodie is. I got one too, but I don't want it. I want daddy of the OVC. Give me the SEMO Red Hawk. Sweep at home. Guarantee it. Wow. Yeah. A I sweep. Love it. All right. All right. All right. Let's 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 do this realistically. We financially speaking, there's no hypothetical investing between this pod, but we do love a good guarantee. I'll guarantee a Moorhead series win. On our Sunday night pod, if you do as well, I don't know. No, this is this is what this is what the stake should be. Okay. If if one of the teams sweep, the other person has to. Okay, I'm guarantee. with that. I'm with so that. if it's two to one, then it doesn't matter. Like it's just okay. a wash. All but right, if one of the teams the sweep, one wait, of us has to guarantee. Wait, wait, wait. All right, all right. If Simo sweep, you guys are both going to stand up and piss your pants live yeah. on live on. on the, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If, more head sweep. I have to piss my pants live on air. Fantastic. All right. I love that. Okay. If one team just wins the series, nothing. You just get your no, point and pick it. Nothing. Up. Yeah. Oh, buddy. Man, I don't know if I'm going to find a fetish in watching you guys piss your pants live on TV because that's going to be glorious. The boy break. Coach Brayden's got us right. I ain't worried. Yeah. Look, we're fine. I, I will make sure. I, I will have to. Um, you can just yeah, book I'll, I'll greasy umpires. You I'll straight up greasy son. umpires. I'll call them up. Yeah. Offer them oh, some money. Oh, hey, oh. just borrow one of Brooks' diapers and piss your pants, and you're fine. <laughs> yeah, I could. Uh, I could definitely grab my son's diapers and wear one. That's what I should do. Just wear his diaper, squeeze in that little thing. It'd be cool. Anyways, go. we got we got All the right. battle of uh, the old Civil War. I don't think we can call it that anymore. But Oregon at Oregon State. Um, I'm getting a little freaky with my pick. I, I think both of these teams are playing pretty bad baseball right now. And like Oregon State, they've lost four straight Pac-12 se- uh, games. 
like four of their last five or five or last six games overall. Um, they've almost dropped out of the hosting picture. I'm just going to take Oregon. Like, I, I I don't know. I think the series is going to get weird. Oregon's super talented as well. Um, Oregon State's kind of burned me investment-wise recently, so I'm, I'm not happy with them, not on speaking terms. And, like, this series typically gets, like, like it doesn't matter if Oregon State's the number one team in the country and Oregon's unranked. Like, I mean, yeah, I think I said that right. It, it, it reminds me a lot of, like a Ravens versus Steelers football game. Like it doesn't matter what the records are. Like they're going to play each other competitively. And I, I, I think Oregon has a chance to maybe catch this Oregon state team down. Um, Oregon state's pitching has not been great. So I'll take my chances with the ducks. I, and also I just need to pick up ground on the standings. So I feel like everybody's taking Oregon state here. So ben. let me, uh, let me try to pick up some ground late All in the right. season. Hey, I love I love the strategy there. Gain some ground, take a take a risk with Oregon. Do you really think Oregon State is about to lose four straight series? It won't be four straight series, will it? Pac twelve. Four straight Pac twelve series? No, sorry, yeah. sorry, I don't know what I. I'm, They've I'm, lost four straight games. Four straight yeah, Pac twelve no, games. Uh, Got swept by three. Utah. Lost to Stanford. Yeah, no, I don't sorry. actually think like sorry. I think Oregon State's going to win this series, but I'm picking Oregon. Um, you threw me off there. I was like, yeah, no, they just won a series against Stanford like two weeks ago. So they like, lost this is a prime like bounce games. back, prime bounce back spot for the Beavers. They've been playing terribly, but they're good enough. Like they have good, they have really good talent. Um, the pitching's been shaky, but like Beavers, yeah, Beavers will defend the dam. And they will take this series at home. Travis Bedana will go for, I don't know, five for 11 with two home runs this weekend. Uh, no, let's go six for 13 with two home runs this weekend. Well, hey, if he's only getting 13 at bats this weekend, I think the Ducks win. Why? That's three games, four AB of the game. Yeah, I know. Oregon's going to score 10 runs a game. I know. Give me the, um, give me the Beavers. I'm glad that you talked about South Paul's in the lineup because you're right. I, I think that 90% of the country is going to be on Oregon State here. They've got one of the best second basemen in the country. Um, Travis Bazzano is pretty good, but I'll tell you also is pretty good. Let me introduce you guys to the young man of Jacob Walsh, the nation's hottest hitter at the moment. Went 8 of 12 last week, right? Hit 750. Nobody's hotter than Lyle Miller Green, so that's a lie. Nobody's hotter than Lyle Miller Green. That guy's a first round pick. We're standing on business with LMG. Thank you for bringing that up, Riz God. But Jacob Walsh was what's the player of the week. He had oh, four second hottest? Second hot. Yeah, but Lyle's just the hottest player in baseball in general. And I'm not even talking about from a baseball standpoint. Wow. Uh, Jacob Walsh, though, big fella, Southpaw for Oregon. Uh, he's a monster with a bad man. I've taken Oregon this year just because they used a pencil bat. Now I'm coming at you with a little bit of research. They've got two guys on the midseason stopper award list. Jacob Walsh, who's the hotter in the country. I don't know what it is, but my frequency is with Mr. Upton here. I, I think that Oregon wins this series. And I'll tell you why, because similar to what we said about DBU last week, excuse me, what I said about DBU last week, I think Oregon State's in the middle of their cold period of the season. Started out hot, playing really, really cold baseball. I think Oregon takes advantage of that, and I think they need a little bit of help to get that at-large spot. I don't know what their RPI is right now. Uh, but they need to start winning some baseball games. I think Oregon wins the series. I think Oregon State's fine. I think this is more about Oregon. Justin Casella is a really nice transfer from Elon, uh, going from the east to the west coast. He's he's plugged in place really well uh, in that lineup. But I think Oregon surprises a lot of people this weekend. Yeah, here's another little nugget about Oregon. Like they've won every single weekend series except for the Stanford one this past weekend. They they scored a bunch of runs. They just gave up a ton of runs. Um, at Stanford. Oh, never mind. I take it back. They also lost a weekend series um, against UC Santa Barbara. But like for the most part, like they won two out of three at that Shriners Children's College Classic. They beat Oklahoma. They beat Baylor. Um, they won two out of three against Arizona State, Cal, Arizona, Seattle, um, U UCLA, USC. Like they're a pretty good weekend team. So and, and what's interesting about this series is they also play each other in the midweek on Tuesday. So they're playing three at Corvallis uh, against Oregon State, and then they come back to Eugene on Tuesday and play against Oregon State as well. So it's kind of a four-game series. And look, I think Oregon State's safely in the tournament. Oregon with a 61 RPI, like this is a must-win weekend. Like yeah. you got to at least win two out of four against Oregon State here. Um, so 
What That's are they, my pick. 61 in the RPI? 61? Yeah, there's 61 in the RPI. So, like, right now, they would not be in the at-large picture at all. All right, Dimitri needs to leave in four minutes. So, let's go ahead and get his picks here, and then Jack and I will kind of wrap up the show. Florida State at Duke. Look, I'm tired of Florida State. I, I'm tired of picking Florida State. I think they're a really good team. Uh, they just do not show up on the road. Their bullpen has been very bad. Like, they'll score six runs in the first inning and then give up seven. They're kind of like the Houston Astros. Um, look, I think I want to pick Florida State here, but like I've picked them so many times and let me down. So give me Duke. Duke at home. Give me Florida State when nobody trusts them anymore. Nobody believes them anymore because they that series at Way Forest when they could have easily won that series at Way Forest. Give me Florida State against Duke. My ACC preseason pick is the Seminoles, and I'm going to ride them because they're going to come out the next three weeks and they're going to take the crown. Give me the Noles in. If you guys need a good social media follow, go follow Duke Baseball. Chad Knight, Roman Giacomo are doing awesome stuff on that page. They went and played wiffle ball with kids on campus. They tried to get them to come out and pack the jack this weekend. Give me Duke. I, I think Duke is primed to make a big jump this weekend. Like, I, I know they're two games back to lead in the ACC. They go win this series, and then all of a sudden, that North Carolina series to end the year will really be for all the marbles. I, I'm such a believer in Duke for so many reasons. Um, hey. Not – on Florida State, but I, I like Duke this weekend. Jamie I'm Arnold versus say, Jonathan like, Santucci on Friday is going to be electric, by the way. Two so, of the best lefties in the country, other than Hagen Smith, of course. Right, so. Arnold versus Santucci. That is, you might want to sit down and watch that one. But yeah. I like Duke. I really like Duke. I think they were they're one of my picks to make Omaha preseason. I think they're really good at home. I just think when you get a team like Florida State, you, you were so close to winning that series that wake. I think they're going to come back ready to go. Some of the guys will be a little bit healthier, ready to go. Um, so, yeah, I, I just like Florida State for this weekend only. Riz, yeah. guys, you know, what, you know what it come down to me from an actual baseball standpoint is that, like, Duke in that Virginia Tech series was insane. It was just a total hit parade. So many, like, back-and-forth lead changes. Florida State's offense can do that with Duke and, and are very much so equipped to do that. I just think Duke's bullpen's better than Florida State's bullpen this weekend, and that's where, cool. I, you know? Yeah. All right, Southern Miss at Louisiana. Um, boys, Louisiana lost a big one uh, yesterday to Houston Christian. Shout out to the big Puma, Lance Berkman. Big midweek win. Um, guys, Louisiana is not even in the postseason picture right now. I know they have a four-game lead uh, in the Sun Belt, but their RPI is bad. They dropped like 19 spots uh, since Tuesday. They're like 58 right now. Um, not good. Must-win weekend here for Louisiana Raging Cajuns. And like, I know standings in conference mean a lot. Like maybe if the season ended and they won four, like basically what I'm saying is like if Louisiana wins the Sun Belt regular season and don't win the um, the tournament to get that EQ bid, like Louisiana might still get in the tournament with even with a bad RPI, but like they need to figure it out. Hey, you gotta um, remember, you gotta remember your RPI. If if hypothetically they win the Sun Belt, that means they win enough games to hold their lead. Their RPI will come back up, and then they'll get another one or two RPI booster games in the Sun Belt tournament. They're not miss if they win the Sun Belt regular season, they're not missing the tournament. Yeah. Um, anyways, my pick for this weekend, I, I think I'm three and zero picking Southern Miss and weekend series pick them. So give me the uh, give me the Golden Eagles again. This is a great this is great news for Louisiana fans though. Uh, I have yet to figure out their team. So give me Southern Miss on the road. Give me the Raging Cajuns on a Sunday rubber match in the Tiger Red, the Sunday Red. Louisiana will defend the team and take this series. It is a great spot to take the Cajun. Last weekend, Coastal Carolina, they, they battled all weekend on the road. I think the Southern Miss team has been struggling a little bit to sweep team, but I think the Louisiana team is good enough to go 1-1 and take the, take the rubber match on Sunday, and I really like Louisiana to win the series. This Boom. is a prime series where like a star player is going to come out. And like I could totally see Kyle DeBarge coming out. Like This is his coming out story. He's been out. Um, He's been out. Well, I know he has, but like I'm talking like on a national presence. Like hits four or five homers this weekend, red hot the plate. Like, I can just see it now. Look, but one more nugget I want to make about Southern Miss. They uh like this feels like the Southern Miss team that's gonna actually make it to Omaha. No pressure. They're not gonna host a regional. Uh they made it the year before Scott Berry became the head coach. Why not make it the year after he leaves? Um I, I can just see them flying under the radar as a three seed and uh somehow making it to Omaha this year. Like just because nobody's expecting it. Yeah. So they usually play really good late in the season. Like that historically, Southern Miss gets better in late April, early May. So 
Well, Ben, you, you mentioned stars, right? I, I think that with DMAC back in that Southern Miss offense, right, for them, that's a huge plus for them. These are both tournament teams in my eyes. Like, these are both teams that I think we're going to see in a regional. I think Southern Miss wins on Friday night. I like their Friday guy a little bit better than I like the Raging Cajuns. I, I think with their back against the wall, though, give me give me the Cajuns, though. I, I'm with Rizgott here. I, I think that you're right. This this offense, um, I think, goes crazy on a Sunday, run day, fun day, and they end up winning the rubber match. But I do think that these are both tournament teams, but I'll, I'll take Louisiana at home. Southern Miss is also terrible on Sundays. Like I think they they're kind of like LSU. They just keep losing Sundays. So um, that's something else to keep in mind. Anyways, last series I know Dimitri's got to leave. Um, but Kentucky at South Carolina, give me the Cats. Give me the Cats. Like they they proved a lot to me last weekend. They were fun to watch. And in fact, I ordered a retro Kentucky. I'll show you guys right now. I I, I ordered a retro Kentucky shirt on Instagram uh, from one of these vintage guys that I follow. Shout out Ooh, to uh, ben, ben hopping on the uh, BBN Nation. Yeah, scoop and score ATL. Oh man, the picture went away. Anyway, while he's looking for it, give me Big Blue Nation. I'm rolling with Kentucky at Founders Park. They showed me everything I need to see against Tennessee. I think Tennessee was just a little deeper, a little better last weekend, but Kentucky will rebound. Um, they are definitely a force to be reckoned with. They are. I'd say. Cool. That's pretty cool. Lightning in the Jack's biggest fear, lightning. Oh, Cat big shirt. Fear. Yeah. For those I'm who are in that Omaha this year. Anyways, yep. South Carolina, Ben said they're one of the worst teams he's ever seen a couple weeks ago. Um, they're probably not say that. The worst team I said they look like the most Carolina. unmotivated team in the SEC <laughs> when they were playing at Ole Miss. They've turned it around. Look, so, dude, South Carolina at home has been really good this year. They I just think Kentucky. They like to get in the mud. Kentucky doesn't matter if they're playing at home. They probably prefer to play on the road. And uh, they get in the mud. They're just built different. So give me Kentucky. Give me the cat in Founders Park in Columbia. I like Kentucky. Uh, Ryan Walchmidt, Nikki Lopez, hell of a one to punch that Kentucky lineup. They've been a lot of fun to watch this year. How about that dude, Roman Kimball, going to drop Pencil Talk Takeover with him next week. Was lights out last Friday night. You see. Go Cox! Give me the Gox. I think they win the series uh, on Friday, and then I think they win the rubber match on Sunday. Um, you're right. Founders Park is a different animal with the Cox rolling. And um, I think them and Georgia are kind of really in a unique spot. Georgia's got the gauntlet on the back half. South Carolina not looking at a lighter back half. But after they get through Kentucky, they've got some favorable matchups. And I think they've got an opportunity to be a regional seed, uh, a national seed. So uh, give me the Cox. Love it, boys. All right, Dimitri, you can hop off. Jack and I will, will finish up the show here. All right. Um, you guys make sure you talk sure. lots of shit about me while I'm gone. Yeah, um, that's what we're going to do. Yep. I love <laughs> it. I love you guys. Bye. See you. Ciao.